none of anything that I've written is ever intended to hurt my family. He's like, no, 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 when we're at school, we don't know each other. And I took that personally. And he was coming for my wife. She wasn't there at the time. And he snapped. Is it ever intended to hurt my family? I left my career, my life. How does Prince Harry portray his problematic relationship to his family, particularly William? And how does he present himself and Meghan in comparison? By analyzing crucial clips from Harry's 60 Minutes interview, we're able to answer these questions. Welcome to the channel where we analyze the language of influential people. If you find language exciting, subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell for all updates. Let us know what you think about this interview. I hope you're ready, because things are about to get intense. Let's go for it. You write about a, a contentious meeting you had with him in 2021. You said, I looked at Willie, really looked at him, maybe for the first time since we were boys. I took it all in. His familiar scowl, which had always been his default in dealings with me, his alarming baldness, more advanced than my own, his famous resemblance to mummy, which was fading with time, with age. It's pretty cutting. I don't see it as cutting at all. The most relevant follow-up question to this would be, what do you see as cutting? We should note that Harry writes his familiar scowl, which had always been his default in dealings with me. By definition, always means every single time, and dealing is a synonym to a word like interaction. However, unlike interaction, dealing indicates distant and dismissive conversations. By inference, then, William's alleged scowl doesn't just occur when they're arguing, but also when they're just talking. Thus, this is a rather big claim on Harry's part, one that conveniently places him in a defensive role, unlike William. One of the definitions of the word cutting is inclined or likely to wound the feelings of others, especially because of a ruthless incisiveness. Harry says he doesn't think it's cutting before adding at all for overemphasis. However, is this overemphasis fair, or to ask a different question? How is this passage not likely to wound the feelings of William and by extension Catherine, as both of them would most likely have preferred that Harry hadn't written this passage, a book? We can't prove that it wounds William's feelings, however, it's at least likely to wound him, which was the question Harry was essentially asked. Thus, his overemphasized denial is unreliable. I don't see it as cutting at all. We can always recognize a narrative's ulterior motives on the amount of unnecessary details, meaning details that have nothing to do with the main event in a person's narrative, the main event here being Harry and William's argument. Thus, the descriptions, his alarming baldness, more advanced than my own, and his famous resemblance to mummy, which was fading with time, with age, are irrelevant as such. However, they're there for a reason, and this reason has to do with how features are written, because this passage and many other passages in this book are written as if they're features in a newspaper. Contrary to traditional news reporting, features are characterized by a scene-by-scene -scene construction, like movies and fiction. There are dialogues and information about the body language of the informants. There's a third-person perspective, so-called omniscient narration, meaning that the writer slides in and out of the presumed feelings and thoughts of the characters in the text. Finally, there are telling details. So rather than writing that William's upset, it's entirely expected that Harry focuses on William's alleged scowl, leaving it up to the audience to infer that he's upset. Therefore, there's a lot to be skeptical of when reading Harry's biography, or any other biography. Like movies, features create protagonists and antagonists, which is why there's always a reason for the seemingly unnecessary details. I say seemingly because these details are obviously important for the writer, who has an interest in portraying himself in the best light possible. Thus, what could have been a funny remark if the circumstances were different, baldness more advanced than my own, takes on a deeper and darker meaning given the situation, two brothers who were barely speaking to one another. In light of this, Harry's inclusion of the adjective famous, his famous resemblance to mummy which was fading, is also worth noting, as famous is a reference to how William's been perceived in the public eye, and interestingly, how Harry's likely felt about it. In another interview, Harry was more explicit about feeling inferior. There has always been this competition between us, weirdly. Again, I think it really plays into, always played by the air spare. His life is, is planned out for him. 
Yeah. Whereas for the spare, that's not really what you should do. You should kind of be sitting there a little bit in the monarch shadow and just wait your turn. In conclusion then, Harry's feature-like descriptions can definitely be perceived as cutting. So, uh, yes? Did you put in a good word for me? It's just that you talked about putting in a good word for me at the board meeting. Oh yeah, the board meeting. Yes, I most certainly did. You can be sure of that. Thanks. What you say? Oh, you know, the truth. That you're calm and quiet. And of course, I might have said that you need a haircut and some new clothes. You know, innocuous things like that. It wasn't cutting, if that's what you think. It wasn't intended to hurt you in any way. You and I are friends. Yeah, I know. Sometimes it's like I forget. That's completely normal. I really do hope you get that promotion. You've earned it. Thanks. Any time. Um, you know, my brother and I love each other. I love him deeply. There has been a lot of pain between the two of us, especially the last six years. Um, Whether it's intentional or not, Harry is confusing intention with perception. People's perception of a writer's claims doesn't always correspond to said writer's intention with their claims. In light of this, Harry's claims to love his brother deeply have nothing to do with the topic at hand. The topic is about whether or not the passage and book is cutting. It's not about whether or not he loves his brother. Thus, this isn't an actual counter-argument. Also, it's the pain between the two of them that he makes the syntactic focus by placing it at the end of these connected thoughts. Syntactically then, but also as Harry himself directly stated in the Oprah interview, the pain appears to outweigh the deep love. And next, things are about to get more revealing in terms of what Harry really wants to emphasize in this interview. None of anything that I've written and anything I've included is ever intended to hurt my family. But it does give a full picture of the situation as we were growing up. This isn't so much the full picture of the situation as it's Harry's picture of the situation, how he experienced it. As long as it's different versions of the same situation, one side can be said to be more authoritative than the other. This is the other side of the story, right? After 38 years. They've told their side of the story, this is the other side of the story, and... Again, this isn't so much the other side of the story, as it's his and Megan's side of the story. Also, as I suspect many of you have heard me say once or twice or a thousand times before, the function of the conjunction but is to minimize or even negate that which precedes it. This conjunction introduces the syntactic focus in a given sentence. Is ever intended to hurt my family, but it does give a full picture. Syntactically then, Harry assigns focus to the alleged full picture, rather than his claim to never wanting to hurt his family. Harry says he hasn't included anything intended to ever hurt his family. Just the one passage we've heard could be said to contradict that, and the interviewer didn't even include passages describing how William allegedly grabbed Harry by the collar, that Catherine allegedly made Meghan cry and that William and Catherine allegedly encouraged Harry to wear a certain controversial costume to a party long ago. Even if we believed Harry that these things weren't meant to hurt his family, the passages are still there, and they're there for a reason, and that reason has to do with damage control. Portraying him and Meghan in the best light possible, and by implication, portraying his family in a negative light. You can't have a protagonist without an antagonist. I wonder what would have happened to us had we not gone out when we did. Our security was being pulled. Everyone in the world knew where we were. I said, we need to get out of here. We are on the freedom flight. They were happy to lie to protect my brother. They were never willing to tell the truth to protect us. 
When you, as a couple, choose to do interviews and documentaries together, you're responsible for what the other person says. Therefore, unless Harry contradicts her in the interview, Megan's complaints are also attributed to Harry. And I think the next clip, which I like to play, exposes the level of entitlement we're dealing with here, like no other clip I've ever seen. If these are problems, I think many people would like to trade problems. There are even stories that you knew all along that this was going to happen, you went through the whole process, and it was all intentional to build your brand. Can you imagine how little sense that makes? I left my career, my life, I left everything because I love him, right? For me, I mean, I wrote letters to his family when I got there saying, I am dedicated to this. I'm here for you. Use me as you'd like. There was no guidance as well, right? Mm -hmm. There were certain things that you couldn't do, but you know, unlike what you see in the movies, there's no class on how to how to speak, how to cross your legs, how to be royal. No, no I mean it's, no, it's, but even down yeah, sorry, but even down to like the national anthem. <laughs> No one thought to say, oh, you're American. You're not going to know that. That's me late at night Googling, how, what's the national? I've got to learn this. I don't want to embarrass them. I need to learn these 30 mm -hmm. hymns for a church. All of this is televised. Megan makes it sound like she made a huge effort trying to fit into the royal family. She contrasts the letters she allegedly wrote to the family with the family not offering her any guidance, supposedly. The implication being that she did a lot, but didn't get anything in return, even though this implication is contradicted by her own complaints, because firstly, these complaints, having to learn how to cross her legs and sing a song, aren't real problems. And secondly, since she obviously considers these events as not only problems, but also problems worthy of being mentioned in a big interview like this, it unintentionally speaks volumes about her lack of motivation for learning, as learning a song or even the 30 songs she mentions, which should be an easy task when you've had at least two years to do it. Thus, like Harry's interview, Megan's complaining is exposed as damage control, trying to save face. And generally, damage control isn't exactly characterized by fair and logical arguments. And like Harry's book, Megan's complaints about anything and everything, from Catherine, who allegedly hurt her feelings, to losing her voice like the Little Mermaid, are indeed cutting. Likely, or more than likely, to wound the feelings, and more important in a public sense, reputation of the royal family. Harry keeps exposing what this interview is really about, to make excuses for Megan the situation as we were growing up, and also squashes this idea that somehow my wife was the one that destroyed the relationship between these two brothers. While we can't prove that Meghan was the straw that broke the camel's back as far as the relationship between Harry and William goes, Harry claiming that his side of the story squashes this idea isn't entirely convincing. By his own admission, the two of them had heated arguments over Meghan, with William calling her abrasive and rude, even supposedly pointing his finger in Meghan's face. Also, Meghan's complaining in the Oprah interview doesn't exactly give the impression that she was trying to bond with the family, to put it mildly. The level of her complaint suggests that she wasn't trying too hard. Even when you were in the same school, in high school... Sibling rivalry. Your brother told you, pretend we don't know each other. Oh yeah, I forgot that one. Another claim that isn't intended to hurt anyone, but is entirely necessary for the world to hear. Yeah, and at the time it hurt. I couldn't make sense of it. I was like, what do you mean? I'm, we're now at the same school. Like, I haven't seen you for ages. Now we get to hang out together? He's like, no, 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 when we're at school we don't know each other. And I took that personally. I don't know about you, but this is starting to remind me of the deep conversations and meaningful reality shows. The, the conversation, I thought it was really nice that Kathy owned all that stuff with her sister, I thought with Kyle, and I was like, wow, that was a great moment. I, I see both sides of it. Honestly, I feel bad for Rinna. I, I do, and I know that's not a popular vote. I know, and I, listen, I'm not trying to sink myself. I don't. Next, things are about to escalate. Your arguments with your brother became physical. Um, it was a build-up of uh, frustration, I think, on his part. Um, it was at a time where he was being told certain things by people within his office, and at the same time he was consuming a lot of the tabloid press, a lot of the stories. 
Harry's interjections, vowel lengthenings, and pauses all indicate hesitation as he speculates about William's motives, and the word speculation is key here. Harry can't prove, at least not to our current knowledge, that William was being told things, and he can't prove a causal connection between William allegedly consuming the tabloid press and fighting with Harry over Meghan. That's Harry's convenient interpretation of how things went down, a way for him to evade responsibility. A lot of frustration on his part, Harry says, leaving himself and Meghan out of it, as if they hadn't done anything to upset William. He is, however, kind enough to give William a motive, the tabloids, the tabloids that Harry and Meghan have made millions of of complaining about in podcasts, books and documentaries. And he had a few issues which were based not on reality. Whatever Harry defines as reality, whatever reality he's convinced himself of, no matter what, he can't be referring to an objective reality in this he said, he said situation which belongs in reality shows. And I was defending my wife, and he was coming for my wife. She wasn't there at the time, but through the things that he was saying. This is a clear protagonist-antagonist framework. Still, none of this is supposed to be cutting, of course. Harry's rising intonation during this narration makes it sound like he's asking rather than stating. The rising intonation indicates that a speaker is listing things, things that are supposedly simple and easy to understand. Thus, it can have an oversimplifying function. However, it can also point to undisclosed information, that things aren't as simple as the speaker tries to make it sound like, which is exactly why the speaker tries to make it sound simple. Coupled with his hesitation, it's very likely that we aren't given the full picture here. Furthermore, and this is likely deliberate, Harry overlooks that William had met Meghan several times. William would have dismissed the tabloids that often lie about the members of his family if he had a different view of Meghan. But obviously, Meghan hadn't given him a different impression. I was defending myself and we moved from one room into the kitchen and his frustrations were growing and growing and growing. The perspective here is interesting. William on the offensive, Harry on the defensive. His frustrations, not Harry's. He was shouting at me, I was shouting back at him. It wasn't nice, it wasn't pleasant at all. Finally, Harry includes himself, but as the one who was shouting back, not as the one who initiated the shouting. This could all be true, however, the relevant thing for this analysis is that Harry going public about a fight like this is definitely cutting, to put it mildly, contrary to his previous denial of this word. I don't see it as cutting at all. And he snapped, and he pushed me to the floor. He knocked you over. He knocked me over. Um, I landed on the dog bowl. You cut your back. Yeah, I cut my back. I didn't know about it at the time. Why is the detail, like landing on the dog bowl, included, not just in the book, but also in this interview? It couldn't be because it underlines the protagonist-antagonist framework and portrays Harry as a victim, could it? No. No, that would be too cutting. But, um, yeah, he, he apologized afterwards. It was a pretty nasty experience, but... And of course, it's completely unintentional when Harry syntactically undermines William's apology with how nasty the experience was, and continues talking about how much the fight allegedly hurt him. He asked you not to tell anybody, not to tell Megan. Yeah, and, and I wouldn't have done. I didn't, until she, until she saw on, the, on my back. She goes, what's that? I was like, uh, what? I actually didn't know what she was talking about. And I looked in the mirror, I was like, well, because I'd never, I hadn't seen it. Fortunately for Harry, the interviewer is on his side which is common for all the interviews that Harry and Meghan choose to participate in. What a strange coincidence. The thing that's terrified me the most is history repeating itself. You really feared that your wife, Meghan... Yes, I feared, I feared a lot that the end result, the fact that I lost my mum when I was 12 years old, could easily happen against my wife. Harry consistently uses this narrative to close discussions about Meghan, disregarding the fact that these are two completely different situations, different backgrounds, different contexts, different people. After an event where every single member of the family, senior members of the family had been, including the Queen, and on the front page of the Telegraph, Meghan. I went, oh my God. She was like, but it's not my fault. And I said, I know, my mum felt the same way. 
However, the word terrified is interesting because he's used it consistently about the time when Megan came to him and said that she feared for her mental health. The moment that she came to you had the courage enough to say out loud. Mm -hmm. I had no idea what to do. I, was, I, wasn't, I wasn't prepared for that. I went, I went to a very dark place as well, but I, 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 I wanted to be there for her. And also, we didn't leave right terrified. in that moment, right? This is relevant, as he's always made it sound like he and Megan both underwent more or less traumatic things in the family. The fact that he uses this word, however, suggests that the decision to leave was very much inspired by Megan. He says that he went to a dark place as well, indicating that he wasn't in a dark place before she said this to him, or at least that he wasn't in such a dark place that he thought of leaving the UK. But then again, Harry and Meghan have given so many different reasons for leaving, from the lack of protection to the lack of guidance to mental health issues, that it's difficult to know which one it supposedly was. Harry makes other assumptions as well, particularly about why his family wasn't thrilled about his relationship with Meghan. These assumptions fit right into Harry's victim narrative, which is strangely convenient. I haven't quite figured it out yet. But all those things in the, within the family also were, were sources of mistrust. Yes, you know, my family read the tabloids. You know, it's, it's laid out uh, at breakfast when everyone comes together. So whether you walk around saying you believe it or not, it's still, it's still leaving an imprint in your mind. So if you have that judgment based on a stereotype right at the beginning, it's very, very hard to get over that. Judgment based on a stereotype. Stereotype is quite the buzzword nowadays. Again, Harry's kind enough to excuse his family's alleged judgment, but he overlooks a judgment of his own in the process. His judgment that his family judged based on a stereotype. How is he able to know that? And how can he judge them for judging? Like William and Catherine, they had met Meghan several times and they're used to seeing lies being printed about all of them on a weekly basis. If Meghan had given them a good impression, it seems more than likely that they would have disregarded the tabloids. As a result then, this sounds a lot more like a combination of wishful thinking and again, damage control. Next, Harry is about to explicitly contradict his denial without showing awareness of it. Let's find out how. Soon after their relationship became public, Harry insisted on putting out a statement condemning some of the tabloid coverage of Meghan and what he called, quote, the racial undertones of comment pieces. You write that your dad and your brother, William, were furious with you mm -hmm. for doing that. Why? They felt as though it made them look bad. Harry wrote this in a book that wasn't intended to hurt his family. So my question is, how can information that makes people in your family feel like they look bad not also hurt them? How is this not cutting? I don't see it as cutting at all. I went into this incredibly naive. I had no idea the British press was so bigoted. No, not even by the time of the engagement interview when Meghan had this to say. And I think we were just hit so hard at the beginning with a lot of mistruths that I made the choice to not read anything, positive or negative. It just didn't make sense. And instead, we focused all of our energies just on nurturing our relationship. On us. Yeah. On us. It's one thing that tabloids or anyone quote you out of context, focus on irrelevant details and make up rumors. That's wrong and will always be wrong. It's another thing entirely to only blame one side, the press, for the decisions and contradictory statements you yourself have made. Harry and Meghan's own statements suggest that they're also responsible for the image they have. They make unreliable denials, upgrade mild challenges to big problems, and make assumptions with huge consequences for their respective families. Whatever's left of them, these factors make it difficult for some or many people to be sympathetic towards their narrative. If you liked the video, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and click the like button, which always helps. Thanks for tuning in.